My name is Ilse Marie Lee and I have the privilege of serving as the Dean of the Honours College. I look into the audience and I see these incredible students in front of me and I know our future is so bright. So thank you for this evening. Students, you are going to hear this evening from Mont one of Montana's great statesmen. And then as I drove over and I realized as a naturalized, naturalized citizen, it's one of the United States great statesmen. And then I thought a little bit further and uh, then I realized that this evening is about public service writ large. And then I thought a little bit further and I realized of all the places that I've lived in my life, what has really made a difference in the communities that I've been is public service. And in Montana and here in Bozeman, that's how we roll. That's what we do. So with any other further ado, I would like to introduce our student body president from Helena, Montana, um, Norris Blossom. Would you please do the welcome? Thank you. Thanks, Dean Lee. Good evening, everyone. As Dean Lee mentioned, my name is Norris Blossom, and I have the great honor as serving as the student body president of MSU. Um, thank you all so much for being here tonight. First, I want to welcome our two amazing guests, Regent Brianne Rogers and Senator Max Baucus. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We are all so excited to have you here and excited to hear from you and engage with your ideas. So we really appreciate your presence tonight. And for the audience, yes, let's hear, let's hear more. For the audience, I'd like to give you a little background on Senator Baucus and Regent Rogers. Or Senator Baucus, <laughs> Ambassador Baucus. Um, Ambassador Baucus served as a U.S. Senator for Montana from 1978 to 2014, making him the longest serving Senator in Montana history. While the Chairman of the Senate Committee on Finance, he played an influential role in the debate over health care reform in the United States. President Barack Obama appointed Baucus to the 11th U.S. Ambassador, to the 11th, I'm so sorry, I'm stumbling over my words worse than ever before, bear with me. <laughs> President Obama appointed Baucus to the 11th U.S. Ambassador to the People's Republic of China, a position held from 2014 to 2017. Previously, he served as the representative in the U.S. House of Representatives from 1975 to 1978. Baucus is, a, is retired and living right here in Bozeman, Montana. Regent Brianne Rogers spent 10 years on Baucus's U.S. Senate staff, including serving as his field director in Bozeman from 2009 to 2011. A native of Bozeman, Rogers was appointed to the Montana Board of Regents in 2018, where she currently serves. Bobcats, please join me in welcoming Regent Brianne Rogers and Ambassador Max Baucus. fun to have a little bit of time to reflect on Max's career and um, I think our goal tonight is really to help share with you uh, what a life of lifetime of public service looks like, uh, how Max got into it, um, the steps that he took and the experiences that he had over the years. Um, so I would love to start out early with the early years. Um, Max, could you tell us um, a little bit about your childhood, your upbringing and maybe who some of your early influences were that inspired public service into your Well, yeah, first, Brianna, I just want to thank you. <laughs> and I thank Mike Miles. Where's Mike? Mike's here. And um, Mike and Bree were part of our team, one time or another. And um, Norris, he was doing by president. Um, one of your predecessors was um, a student by president um, from, oh gosh, from uh, Kalispell, Montana. His name will come in a second. And, <laughs> Steve Robing, Steve Robing, Steve Robing, and Elsa, thanks for while well, you do too. But Steve Robing was MSU student by president and worked for, worked for me for several years. Wonderful. Well, um, so what sparked your interest in public service early on? Were there early inspirations? Well, um, I was just a typical kid. Um, going through high school, having fun. Um, that's kind of pretty straight, actually. I didn't party as much as my buddies did, but I had a, I had a good time. <laughs> and I had some girlfriends when I was in high school. 
And, and then I went off to college, and um, same thing there. I really I kind of go into, not through the motions, loved my courses, loved what I was doing. It's really interesting. And, um, and uh, I was kind of always looking a little bit. Growing up on the ranch, I, I sort of knew after a while I'd have one foot on the, on the ranch in Montana, and the other foot outside of Montana, because there's so much going on in the world that, that would be challenging. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't know quite what that would be. Um, but uh, frankly, uh, something happened. I was very lucky. The college I went to had an overseas campus. Oh, I put my name in. Holy mackerel, I got selected. I didn't think I'd get selected that thing. It's over in France, six months. And at the end of six months, this is my junior year, I realized that I hadn't learned anything. It was kind of nuts. They had psychology professors over there, not European history or French or anything else. It's kind of nutty. And so at the <laughs> end of the year, I thought, well, holy mackerel, I, I haven't learned anything. And I'm a little scared about going home, frankly, because I went to other college before and was changing majors and things got all, all out of whack. And so I decided I'm just not going to go home. <laughs> so I put a knapsack on my back <laughs> and a little handbag. And I um, hitchhiked around the world for a year. Um, from Europe, Africa, Asia, around the world. And um, when I was in then Belgian Congo, it just hit me with an epiphany uh, that, you know, the world's getting smaller, our natural resources are diminishing, and gee, if I want my life to be any better, you've got to help work to make it better by working with different countries and different peoples and so forth, and maybe somebody else's life might be a little better. Uh, that, just, that kind of the seeds, I know, it's for later interest in public service. So I came back home, and to be honest, um, man, that was my senior year of college, I was alive. I had just average grades, C's and B's before that. I was alive. I got all A's. I was, I was on fire. And um, then I said, um, well, I want to go to law school. Why law school? Well, I read somewhere um, in the, the French you know, historian de Tocqueville. He said, you know, in America, um, lawyers are kind of the nuts and bolts of American society. But they kind of put things together. It things kind of happen. And I thought to myself, well, I think I might want to be some of those nuts and bolts, <laughs> do something like that. And so I went to law school. And I, I must say, I'll try to cut this short, I have a deep, abiding, almost reverence for our Constitution. I took a course in the college called Civil Rights, Civil Liberties. Just loved it. And um, so anyway, all these kind of happen. And I uh, said, so that's kind of what I do. Went to Washington, D.C., worked for public agency for a while, and, and um, after three years there, I decided, okay, Max, now what are you gonna do? Um, you're 27, eight years old, you better decide what you wanna do for the rest of your life. <laughs> About time. And um, my, my inspiration was Mike Mansfield, Montana Senator, and Lee Metcalf. Really liked them, revered them. And I went to talk to them, advice, I'll cut this short by saying they encouraged me to get public service. And uh, that's my right thing to do. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I come home, run for office, and go for it. And so, did you meet uh, Senator Mansfield and uh, Representative Matt Kaff at Boys Nation first, or just when you were working in D.C. as a lawyer? Yeah. Oh, no, I first met them. I was in Boys State. And, uh, <clears throat> and then I got selected to go to Boys Nation. But I learned a political lesson that. <laughs> um, one fellow went was the governor of Boy State. His name was Larry Short from Billings. But I was selected because they had something called the most outstanding citizen. <laughs> well, why the hell was I the most outstanding citizen? <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lesson. <laughs> because people knew me. Why they know me? Because um, I, I, I played the organ. I, I had a little skit. I, Played the organ. I remember the piece I played is it's apple, cherry blossom, and apple blossom white. And I had played that. Well, people knew me. That's the guy that played the organ. Also, the lesson was if you're well known, you got a better chance of making it than if you're not. That's the pro tip for you, Norris. <laughs> <laughs> Learn the organ. 
fun things. Um, and you talked a little bit about how your major changed a little bit. Um, yeah. Following your international travel, did you change it again, or did you just stick through? Was there and was there a different major you would have, you should have pursued before going into law school? Well, I don't know. No, um, those are two questions. One is I started as a math major. That didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> then I said, well, I'll go double E. That didn't last, last very long either. <laughs> then, I, then I'm overseas. Then I came back, and you know, they said, they, well, I changed, I transferred different colleges. That's a mess. So I fell into economics. I got to fill into it. It was not a passion. Mm -hmm. The second question asking, what, what would I have done all over again? I don't know the matters really. <laughs> um, just <laughs> take the courses you like, do what you want to do. And um, that's really it. Some people say take English, some journalism, political science. Yeah, maybe. That's not really necessary by any stress of imagination. Take what you like and do it and just go for it. Great. So 1971 comes around and you head back to Montana to be the executive director of the Constitutional Convention. Yeah. Um, were there additional lessons or people that you met there that or sort of the final push to inspire you to run for public No, office. my mind is made up ahead of time. Got it. I, I, would, you know, I worked there, loved it. They're great people there. They're wonderful people. Don't forget, at that time, um, delegates to the mind, we had not written the Constitution since 1889, something like that. Um, at that time, if you're, to be a member of the Constitutional Convention, you could not have been a prior office holder. You could not have been a prior legislator nor could you run again for legislation. Mm. So these are all people who didn't have a political career ahead of them or axe to grind. They cared about Montana. They want what's best for the state. And, uh, this, and, and the staff, too. We had terrific staff, uh, really bright people. It just is it's, it's, it's wonderful. And um, it's, just, it's just, it's a time to, well, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, so let's talk about when you finally decided to put yourself out there and uh, run for Congress and run for the legislature. Um, you know, everyone knows about your walk across the state. Uh, what inspired that and what lessons did you learn from it? Well, you're right. I put myself out there. That was a blizzard. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, I mean, I'll be dead honest. Um, when I came home, I, I really care about our state. I love our state. And by one, public service. I'll be really honest. I remember sitting back in my office in Washington, D.C., working for the Security Exchange Commission, asking myself, okay, what do you want to do? I think I'd kind of like to be a U.S. Senator. I'd like to represent Montana, the U.S. Senator. I think that's the kind of one to do. Well, how do you get there? First, got to go home and be home. And, um, I said, well, I think I'll, I'll run, I want to run for the legislature in Montana. And I said, well, gee, there must be some residency requirement. So I called the Montana Secretary of State. <laughs> <laughs> Holy mackerel, I had to be home in two weeks. It was a one-year residency requirement. So I walked into my boss, the chairman of the SEC, said, Mr. Chairman, I, 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 I got to go home. He was very good about it, because he ran for Congress earlier the New York lost. He was very good. And I went home, and I did everything he's supposed to do. I got my bank account, and I got my driver's license, and I just to show I'm a real true blue home in Missoula. I moved to Missoula. Why Missoula? Mike Mansfield asked me where I'm going to go to. Where, where, where am I going to go when I go home? So I said, I don't know for sure. He said, whatever you do, don't go to Helena. <laughs> <laughs> I knew exactly what he meant. Helena is not where the people live. <laughs> Helena is a government town. He, everybody in Helena was against the government, around the government. But it just, it's not where the people live. And I um, so I decided to go to Missoula. Bozeman wasn't as hot then as it is today. To be honest, I didn't like Great Falls. I moved to Great Falls. <laughs> I loved at Great Falls. I learned a real lesson there, too. I mean, dead honest about all this stuff. Having been away for a long time, I kind of thought, gee, and I've got pretty well-known parents and all this. I'll come home. People want to, well, kind of, somebody kind of welcome me with open arms. I got off the plane. I think it was Helen. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was, it was I, I went into a wall. Max, 
you got to eat all the humble pie you can possibly consume. You don't run, you don't say where your parents are, you don't say the schools you went to, you are just max. You're a person. And you really, you just, you just, you know, that was so important because that's who we are as Montanans. The way our state puts on airs. If you do, you get taken down. You know, it doesn't work. This state, big states, maybe, not our state. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, I, I said. Yeah. Um, and we're going to convention. Yeah, it's a long answer to the convention. Yeah. They're great people. A lot of lessons there are just how wonderful it is to be a public servant and do what you think is right. Yeah. So, it sounds like you had some early inspiration, met some incredible people, young in life, but just had that drive you know, going through your blood the whole time. Um, how did you hatch an idea like walking across the state of Montana? <laughs> well, um, And maybe give context, because maybe some folks don't know about your walk. Oh, yeah. Well, um, OK. Um, I, I, as in Montana legislature, one two-year term. Back then, we had two-year terms. and. I was 72. This congressional race, House race in 74. Back then, we had two congressional districts, Western Montana and Eastern Montana. In 1990, we lost all that with one congressional district. Okay, Max, you're going to run um, for Congress. But well, first, got to win the primary. You know, and that's going to be tough because uh, the two other people running are well known. Democrats in the state of Montana. One is former Congressman Arnold Olson, um, who got beat by Dick Shoup in, seven, in seven, 70. And uh, the other was Pat Williams, very well known, darling of the Democratic Party, darling of the environmental movement, the darling of the labor movement, darling of everybody. And um, who am I? Well, my parents were Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, so how am I going to win a Democratic primary? This is going to be tough. Well, I'm not a great original idea guy, but I'm a pretty good appropriator of somebody else's good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, several people walked across their states. I knew you get tiny lot and childs in Florida, Dan Walker in Illinois. I said, you know, Max, if you're going to differentiate yourself from these other two Democrats, they're good people. Maybe the best thing to do is walk across the state, get some publicity. And uh, so that's what I did. My staff was totally against it. <laughs> it's the dumbest thing in the world to walk across my I I did not hesitate one nanosecond. Uh -uh, this is what we're gonna do. And so I started out in Gardner. It took two and a half months. Walk up to um, the Dirty Shane Bar, up the Yak River Road, <laughs> up near Libby. And the rules were: I walked every step of the way. I could get a car to go back to where I'd been. And take a car to go back to where I stopped walking. But once I got to that point, I would walk the whole way. And a fellow with me, Dave Cody from Butte, we had a camper, took the camper up about a mile up the road, <clears throat> my name on it, kind of parked perpendicular. <laughs> so somebody driving around at the road have some idea who that nut is walking down the road. <laughs> it was wonderful. That was day one. <laughs> I you know, you never get you know what's gonna happen. I got a camper early one morning, parked there, gardener, got up and started walking, holy and mackerel ran across a commando blizzard. <laughs> and, uh, that photograph was all across the country. Would you think a Montana paper would publish it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well luckily it worked. It worked. And you won. Um, and during your time in Congress, uh, you really prided yourself, in my opinion, on being available to the public. You held so many regular town halls, even on very controversial yeah. issues. Um, you held work days where you actually walked in the shoes of an everyday Montanan. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about what it was like to just a day of, a day in the life of a U.S. senator? Well, um, yeah. Well, I, I okay. Part of it was in 1974, the Watergate class. You might remember Richard Nixon got booted up, out, and Carter won, I guess it's 76, I guess it was. And that was the era of, oh, total transparency. Good government. Jimmy Carter was very much a good government guy. Open, 
all of that. And so I came to the Watergate class. There's 74 Democrats elected in the House here. So that just is transferred also into the into the uh, Senate. Uh, I loved it. I had these work days you mentioned. I show up eight o'clock morning. My sack lunch, not to watch but to work all day long. First job was up at the Columbia Falls aluminum plant. I was stoking those hot, hot, hot those pot, pots. Um, it was hot as many places, <laughs> and I was sick. I was sore for about a week. Muscles, and um, it's and I wait, waited tables. I rode shotgun on trucks, and my God, I did everything. I loved it. Got here in the 19th Street over here. I, I helped pave the roads a little bit, and um, rode shotgun. I rode the road. I rode uh, what's it in, in Billings, you know, right, right along. Oh, and the law, for, law oh, enforcement. Yeah, yeah. I man, everything happened that night too. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? that one? I kind of watched when I worked. However. Middle of the night, got the call, officer down. I'm like, oh, these cars, we go to converse. All the officers down. My guy jumped out of the car to help up. We had earlier picked up a guy back in the car. <laughs> so I was turning to me and says, watch my man. <laughs> so I watched him. <laughs> no, it, it's wonderful. I mean, what happened to, it's, it was all these jobs. We were in Green Chain, we're here this, you know, some oil company or something, or in the mine. I worked in the, I, uh, down the mine down here at, uh, outside of Columbus. Almost always, about this, after a couple hours, there'd be a, a, a break. And guys, had, mostly guys, um, would sit and talk. By then, they kind of realized, hey, this guy's, uh, he, he's not putting one on. I mean, he's really working. He, he was making mistakes. He's, he's banging his hands. He's doing, you know, he's, he's kind of a guy. And so they let their hair down. And they talk. I learn a lot. One real lesson. It was um, the um, who over there in the, at, um, at uh, outside, uh, outside of Billings. The uh, what's it called? The plant there. The, 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 no, no. It was the, the, the refinery. It's outside of Billings. Oh, the like CHS refinery in Laurel or Laurel, Laurel. Anyway, I worked there. This is a big lesson for me, and it's one reason I did this. Um, lunch break. We're all there, I had a box of lunch and eat my sandwich and all that. One big guy said, okay, Bacchus, what do you think about our immigration policy? And um, I said, well, you know what? George Bush was then president. I thought, well, I'll kind of start off kind of in a pretty good direction. I said, I think President Bush is kind of off on the right track. Holy mackerel, these guys took my head off. <laughs> First guy says, oh, he's angry. He says, I said, oh, those, those WAPs, they're coming across the border there. She says, look, they're taking away my, my, my job more than that. My, they're getting free education. I work hard to get my daughter to college. These guys, these jerks get free education. He's going on and on and on. Another guy says, yeah. I says, let those guys climb that electric fence and turn the power on to the top of the fence. <sighs> um, they were really ticked off about immigration. And frankly, it's, it's, it's something I've seen throughout our state a little bit, at least ever since. But, but I learned a lot. I thought I knew, I had a pretty good uh, sense of the pulse of Montana you know, people and voters. I was dead wrong. I had, I had no idea that there was that much vitriol, at least in that group, against immigrants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that, reflecting on our, some of the time that we spent on the road together, every person that would walk up to you would have some specific story where they ran into you on one of your walks across the state or at a work day or a burger bonanza and I'll just never forget how much time you gave people um, instead of just come in for a meeting for an hour leave never talk to them again and I think that that was uh, helped you to really get a better sense of the pulse of Montana and what mattered you gotta come home yep you gotta talk to them yep find out so now we'll move on to um, you're the Senate Finance Committee and your chairmanship. Um, you were involved in crafting enormous policy that shaped the future of our nation, um, from preventing the privatization of Social Security, writing six farm bills, three highway bills, um, and working on our health care system so that insurance companies could no longer dis discriminate against folks with pre-existing conditions. Um, what do you look back upon as your most meaningful achievement? 
Uh, this one is pretty important, the, the Affordable Care Act. We spent a lot of time on that. 15 months, 15, yeah, 15 months. Um, worked very hard. It's very interesting because we did not have a national health care policy then at all. It was just a free-for-all. Insurance companies, providers, hospitals, doctors, medical device manufacturers. It's a free-for-all. Everybody making money, providing some health care. So we worked very, very hard. I read books. I tra um, traveled a little bit. Look at other countries' healthcare systems. Went up to Canada, uh, check them out, for, see what they're up to. And, um, <laughs> and um, it's we had a terrific team. Our healthcare team was led by a lady named Liz Fowler, just really super. And we wrote a white paper, which is a, basically the framework for the Affordable Care Act. We published it in November 08, just after <clears throat> Obama got elected. And frankly, we from the Healthcare perspective, we didn't care who was elected president. Could have been McCain about any difference. We were doing what we thought was right for the country. We published it just after the election, and then other committees did their work on it. And um, so that's, I'm really proud of that. It, it, you know, it didn't cut down, it didn't slow the rise of healthcare costs near as much as I would have liked. But we did a lot of things that you touched on. You know, we made sure insurance companies couldn't deny health care because of pre-existing condition. We really put the clamps on insurance companies. A lot of things get a little technical here. You talk about lifetime limits and all those kinds of things, but it was, that, that is certainly one of them. I, it sounds corny, but it's really true. I really fought for Montana. I got back there and I realized, holy macro, we're at a disadvantage in Montana. We're a small state. All these big states, they get all these big fancy people there marching lobbies in Washington, D.C. and all that. So I put it together, it's called the Rural Healthcare Caucus on that. <laughs> I forget little Harry, kind of Doc Bowen. He was HHS secretary, just nominated our committee had jurisdiction over nominations of lots of folks. And he said he's a rural doc uh, from Indiana. So I had a little calculation. Well, Doc, you think you're rural? <laughs> you about our state. We're 20, I did a little calculation. Indiana versus Montana. We're 22 times more rural than you. <laughs> you um, and another thing, I worked hard for highway funds for Montana. At one point, I'm sure we got $2.20 of highway dollars from Montana for every $1 we sent back there in gasoline taxes. Also, I'm the guy that put a 19th Street interchange. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> It made a lot of people a lot of money with that thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but anyway, it's, um, and oh gosh, legacy stuff, a lot of conservation issues. It's worked really hard. Yeah, you take agriculture, really hard for modern agriculture. Really hard. Because we're an ag state. Mm -hmm. And different than other states, especially from a production standpoint. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's so funny that you bring up your Montana focus because that's what I always felt as a staffer is Montana first always. Um, no matter how busy you were with meeting with executives from every, you know, Fortune 500 company in the nation that was so interested in meeting with Max because under the purview of the Senate Finance Committee, he oversaw all tax, trade, and health policy for the entire nation. It's the best committee in the, Congress, in the whole Congress. Yep. By far. <laughs> yep. But every time you were focused on the delivery from Montana. Well, I got to, I got to tell a story about myself there. Good. <laughs> I was at a senior citizen center over at Billings. I brought up um, Senator um, David Pratt from Arkansas. Really good guy. Oh, he's a wonderful guy. There were a lot of good guys and girls back there. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> David Pratt said that your senator, he is so good, he always puts Montana first. And afterwards, I looked at this, and he's got a sign on his desk. You know what that sign says? Montana first. Well, after a while, I turned to Dave and said, David, I don't have a sign like that on my desk. <laughs> he says, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> and I got one. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Um, but it was so incredible, you know, your economic development summits. We had fun. CEOs really cool. from every big company. In They're the all there. Um, your ambassador tours, where he would bring um, ambassadors from other nations to Montana, tour them around the state, but that wasn't enough. And at every stop, each ambassador would have some deal where they were buying cattle or buying a new um, 
Oh, yeah. You know, airplane maintenance lift platform from Speaker Welding in Living in oh, Lewiston. That's, that's right. Yeah. Right. Um, and you always work to leverage your relationships to ensure that they benefited Montana. Um, what guiding principles did you lead on to make sure that your work was always moving in the right direction? Do us right and, and just keep on working as hard as you can. Yep. And listen, you got to find common ground with the other people. Just find out what they want and it can help tailor how that works for Montana. Um, I, that sounds great. I loved the job. I really did. It was full time. Really liked it. Yeah, full time is an understatement, you guys. Like, <laughs> I don't know that this. I worked for him for ten years. I don't know that I really ever took a day off. You when you look, work, you weren't you weren't lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I was your scheduler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when he wasn't voting in Congress, he was on the plane back to the state. You know, there was never a time where you were just. Um, hanging out in DC or not spending time home. Um, it was such an inspiration to see such a hard worker and it kept us all going. Mm -hmm. um, well, really, you were super, we had a great staff. You, we had a lot of fun. We had a, like, good bunch. Yeah. So as much fun as the Senate was, um, you know, you chose to leave and uh, become the US ambassador to China. Can you tell us about how you made that decision to move on from your Senate career and to China? Well, it's interesting, walking in here, I saw a quote by Norm uh, Esperanza, and the quote is right around the corner there, is, I can't remember the exact words, is to the effect of, to, you know, take chances, take risks. Um, and um, after 36 years in the U.S. Senate, I love the job, but I've done it. And it's kind of, uh, kind of used to it. And I felt that it wasn't being challenged enough. Is that the most difficult professional decision in my life was whether to run again six, eight, or seventh term. I may not have got elected, but you know, maybe. And uh, boy, it was tough. And I turned to Mel, and my wife Mel, and I said, Mel, what do you think we should do? Mel said, no, no, Max, it's your decision. No, no, Mel, we're a team. <laughs> what do you think we should do? <laughs> No, no, it's your decision. <laughs> and um, make a long story short, I just decided I would not be sufficiently true to myself if I took the easy way. And the easy way would be to run again. The harder way is to just not run again, and take the plunge, jump into the ocean to see if you can swim. And um, and I and and uh, I knew it would be kind of challenging and exciting and scary. But all, all the above. So I decided not to run again, and um, and then, but that's that's why I decided not to run again. Is I want want to be challenged and see if I could do something new and different. Yeah. Uh, and you brought a little bit of Montana to China mm -hmm. with some of your approaches and travels. Oh yeah. <laughs> Tell us, tell us about that a little bit with your uh, visits to the provincial governors. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm like all Montanans. I'm an outdoors guy. Uh, I love to walk, love to hike, ski a lot. Don't have ski in a couple of years. Um, I just I like the outdoors, I, and I like walking across the state because I just like getting outdoors, and seeing what's going on outdoors. So when I arrived in China, I. When you arrive, you present your credentials to the president, this is President Xi Jinping. And I told him right off the top, so I'm going to visit every province in China. There are 31. Because I wanted to go out and see what the country's all about. Not just yammer, meetings, <laughs> see what's going on. Taste the food, see what's going on. Smells, people, all that kind of thing. And did. And it was wonderful. Mel and I went to them. Mel couldn't go to all the provinces with me, but we went to um, 21. And and it's kind of funny. Yeah. I mentioned that to President Xi and all the provinces. He looked at me and he said, Your predecessor missed five. <laughs> <laughs> and he took a book on me. Every time I see him, he asked, Okay, now how many? <laughs> and after a while, I said, You've been to more than I have. Um, 
any new perspectives that you arrived at during your time abroad? I know climate change was especially a passion area for you. No, it's so good. It's, um, um, no. The, 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 the realization is that people are people. Um, uh, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'm bored, I'll be very quick. This is one of the more interesting and rewarding times I was over there. I'll be very quick. Um, as, as a meeting in the US, we're on our side, China's on our side of the table, about 200 in the room. And um, it's, um, I was kind of, I knew the end of the line here. Cabinet secretary, all the big people. It's by the time it came to me, I, you know, I had my talkers, and I, I had too much self-respect to repeat this doggone thing all over again. So I just put aside. I just spoke extemporaneously. I looked around the room. And I says, as I look around this room, I see I'm the only person in this room who's ever faced voters. Mm -hmm. Only one in the room. And I've learned a lot facing voters. I've had 18 elections, primaries and generals, and some people like what I do, some people take my head off. Um, but I learned two things. One, that um, we're all alike. People care about basic things. It's a decent income, food on the table, take care of their kids, decent education for the kids, address air and water pollution, be left alone a little bit, decent health care, maybe pursue your dreams. Makes no difference whether you're America or in China. People are people, mm -hmm. and so when we're going around, getting, getting you know, wound around the axle of all this stuff here. Let's kind of remember what this is really all about. When I finished. Um, I, that's, that's, that's another thing I learned is people are pretty smart. And I'm after all, they kind of get it. And then when I finished, the, you know, this we should be thinking about all this. I got applause from the Chinese side. Extemporaneous, so they loved it. Americans, I looked around, what's this all about? <laughs> and uh, I asked, why do they like it so much, the Chinese? And I realized afterwards, because I was talking to them about even keel, wasn't talking down to them, wasn't asking them to do this, do that. It's just because we're all together as people as people. Yeah. And um, that was, that's, that's, that's one thing I learned. I kind of knew it, but it really learned there. Yeah, that's an incredible reflection and great advice for everything. Um, so we're getting close to the end of our time I before we. I know you do. <laughs> before we uh, head on to questions from the audience, but um, I just wanted to take a moment to allow you a second for reflections. You've met a lot of very important people over the years, especially. Yeah, President Clinton. He had to stop. He had asthma. <laughs> it's kind of fun to meet the president. <laughs> Carter, and that's my son. Yeah, really fun. Yeah, so, you know, looking back on your 40 plus years of public service uh, in the current political climate, do you think you would have pursued the same path uh, if you were just starting out on your journey now? Well, times change. I love the job. Do I have any regrets pursuing this career? Not one iota, not one bit. Do you make any money doing it? No. <laughs> Is it rewarding? Yes. I mean, right now, since I've left public service, putting together a public policy institute in the state to help kids get involved in public service, but also on a couple of boards, biology boards, and some clients, and all that, it's not near as much fun. You make some money, you're able to go do some things, but it's not near as much fun. It doesn't even come close. So would I do it over again? Yes. No regrets. Only slight difference is, as I said, times have changed a little bit. <sighs> it's so much more partisan now than back then. And don't forget, back then, when I started, there was no internet. There was no social media. The Senate proceedings were not televised. It was more personal. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that enabled us to kind of to get more done, at least there's much less partisan politics than compared with now. So if you were to ask me today, would I start all over again in the current circumstances? Um, the answer would be yes, but I'm a bit of a glutton for punishment. 
Um, um, it'd be harder. It'd be more frustrating. But it's 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 still rewarding to try to help put things together for your state and people you represent. I was I mean look, let me be honest. We're so lucky to be Montanans. We're so lucky. Because we're a people state, we're not a wholesale po po politics state. It's, it's all person to person in our state. In big states like California, New York, it's all wholesale, it's all media. You're elected by how much you're on TV. TV counts and social media counts. But in our state, it's much more important to do the personal relationships, getting out and shaking hands, being with people. Mm -hmm. When I was in Missoula County, I shook hands, I think, with every single person who lived in Missoula County. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> and, um, but when I, when I say it's so lucky, I'll say this, and I really meant it. At town meetings, um, I'd say, and I really meant it. Back then, we were not quite as many people when I left the center, what, 13? Um, I'd say, I'm so lucky. I have eight, I have 900,000 of the world's best bosses. I'm just the hard hand. I'm the employee here. All want you are my employers. Now sometimes you don't always agree mm -hmm. among yourselves, <laughs> but uh, it's just I have the world's best bosses. It's really important always to keep that in mind that you're working for others, yep. not for yourself. So um, um, even yeah, get back to your question. If um, even today, if you're harder. Um, are challenging, frustrated, but for me, not for others, it'd be the right thing to do. I do it, yes. Yeah, it's a great purposeful life. It's been an honor to get to observe some of it, and I appreciate you so much for sharing so much with everyone tonight, too. It's a great job. You meet so many people, and most people are really great. Yeah. There are a few jerks. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say this very briefly, I don't. It was here I first ran into some jerks. <laughs> um, right outside here. It was during the Affordable Care Act. Oh yeah, that was intense. And I was driving over to go to some event. A bunch of people demonstrating before we got to the to the, to the Museum of the Rockies. And I turned to the person who was driving and said, oh stop, I don't talk to him. I said, no, no, don't do it. Don't do it. I don't want to talk to anybody. <laughs> so I ran out and talked to him. They he, were just, he did it. <laughs> and they were terrible. They would let me answer a question. I found out later that most of them were bust in from Texas. There were demonstrators bust in from Texas. And the first time I encountered uh, an outside group in our state who were there to cause mischief, not to help solve problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember that. That was a really intense time. And we learned a lot, and we got through it. And especially the issue of wedding reception. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, we would love to open it up uh, for questions from the audience, and i um, curious if anyone has any other... No, I'll, I'll, okay. Be candid, be honest, be tough. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if there's some little thing in the back of your brain, mind kind of bugging you a little bit, don't be deaf, don't be bashful, don't be shy. No, I did not learn Chinese. I had dinner with the former Australian Prime Minister, his name is Kevin Rudd. He was an Australian ambassador to China. I dinner with him, Mel and I did, before we went over. I asked him that question, should I learn Chinese? And he said, no. Um, it's too hard, it's too difficult. Um, it's better use of your time is, is to work through interpreters. You've got so much else to do, don't do it. But he said, do this. Learn how to pronounce names perfectly. And learn three or four sentences um, and pronounce them perfectly. And then stop. So that's what I did. But it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I go see uh, somebody like President Xi Jinping, and, uh, and, and the phrase for a long time no see is like, how Joe would you end? So I'd say that, how Joe would you end? He'd like me and he'd come back with something. I don't know what it's like. But he liked it. <laughs>
but no. And I think that approach was the right approach. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, if you have any questions, please just raise your hand and I'll bring you the mic. I really liked your um, story about interacting with the workers that had really strong opinions on immigration that you didn't like probably agree with totally. How did you keep that conversation open, um, even though you had probably some differing opinions on stuff? Well, <laughs> most people are really good people. Now this may sound a little arrogant, but um, they might be a little, um, we may not have all the facts to kind of know what's, what's going on. There once here, um, out here at the uh, edge of town here, at, at, at a wedding reception during the Affordable Care Act, one guy wrote, walked up to me and said, I'm the guy writing those hateful emails. I said, really? He said, yeah, yes, hateful, hateful emails. I said, well, why? And it kind of, Turned out he really wasn't quite sure why. <laughs> but it, um, a lot of it was the Affordable Care Act. And so I said, I started talking about it. it I, my goal was to kind of help educate a little bit. Like, he was smart enough to know he was a golf pro here in town. <laughs> and to you know, try to learn. So I said, guess how much we spend on health care in America? Um, total. Back then, oh, Eight, we paid two, we spent two point five trillion dollars in healthcare. Today it's close to four. So I asked, "What do you think the division is? How much is public and how much is private?" He had no idea. So I said, "Well, it's 50-50. That's what it was. That's what it is. And after healthcare bill, it's the same: fifty-fifty, public and private." Then I asked a couple other questions. Um, do you think? You know, do we give uh, free healthcare to illegal immigrants? Oh yeah, yeah. No, we don't. It's that I wrote the provision of law that says no, no. Healthcare is not given to illegal immigrants in America. So after a while, I could tell he started to understand a little bit. I mean, I'm sure he still hated me. <laughs> but I mean, it, it, was a, I, it was a good conversation. I've got lots of examples like that. One's on guns, and we'll take all the time tonight. It was another very rewarding experience of just talking to people and getting them to, again, ha and realizing, and it, it's respected. But a lot of this comes down to it's just respect. Res and when you listen, respect that person and listen. And just, you know, he's a, he or she's a person. You know, it's a, that's a major lesson I learned in this job, to really respect the other person. And then you find some people who are just the real total jerks. <laughs> you just kind of have to, you just have to walk away. Because you're not going to persuade them. They don't want to listen. This is totally off the record, but given the opportunity, I'd love to ask the question that based on your vast experience uh, in government and working with the Chinese government, do you have any insight that you could give us on how the Chinese are looking with their interest in Taiwan, how they're looking at the situation in the Ukraine? Those are two questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, one day I was walking down the street in, in a big city in China, it's called Chongqing, about 20 million people. It was in the afternoon, late evening, early, late afternoon, but about six, eight o'clock, summer day. I saw over there a table, um, guys in the gal just you know, drinking beer, eating soup, and so forth. So I just walked over there. I said, hey, what are you guys talking about? Sat down, I didn't interpret her. His name is Jim Brown, the world's best by far. <laughs> and um, and um, turned one guy was, was a machine shop operator. Another guy there was visiting from Taiwan, been there about two weeks. And then another student and another owner, the manager of the, the, the cafe there. So right off the top, said, what's the future of Taiwan? And the first guy said, well, it's ours. That's well, like, when? He said, well, I asked, no. Next week, next month, next year, when? When is it yours? Oh, about 15 years. It'll be ours about 15 years. That guy across the table from Taiwan said, no way. 80% of us have nothing to do with the mainland. Our polls showed that. 80% of Taiwanese have nothing to do with the mainland. 
We talked about it a little bit. But then one thing that's really interesting, I asked the next question was, okay, when I say America, what comes to mind? First guy said, oh, open space. I mean, mountains, freedom, democracy. And went around the table, what do you all think? Yeah, about the same. So then I asked the question, okay, what about China? When will China be a democracy? Oh, no way, we'll just collapse if we're a democracy. Body said, you know, about 15 years, maybe. Give us about 15, that might happen. But uh, the lesson on Taiwan is, <laughs> Taiwan is existential to the Chinese government. It is existential. There are several, there are, Tibet, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, uh, and Taiwan. They're existential. The Chinese government won't even consider uh, any compromise in any of them. And we have, Americans have to understand that. Um, now, um, will China, they, they tell me that constantly. Will China invade Taiwan? I don't think so. Um, but they're, because they're gonna play the long game. When President Nixon went over to China, when Henry Kissinger went over to China, um, they, Taiwan came up and Dunk, uh, uh, Mao, uh, Zhou Enlai, the Prime Minister, point said, we'll just put Taiwan on the shelf. We'll just deal with that later. And that's what we've been essentially doing. China wants it. Um, America has a, what's called a one China policy. It's one China. It's interpreted differently by each, but that's what it is. And China plays the long game. They just want to wait. Not sure when they're gonna have Taiwan, but that's, that's their goal. And um, I think, unfortunately, domestic politics in America today is the root of the problem we have with China. That is, no member of the House or Senate will say anything constructive about China for fear of taking his head off. And it just, it, nobody wants to be perceived as soft on China. And so there, therefore, a lot of people in Congress they were bolstered up Taiwan. And during that, I think it's a dangerous game. It's a very dangerous game. Our policy is called um, not all about China, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a strategic ambiguity. <laughs> and I think that's wise. If you're ambiguous about it, it don't rock the boat too much. Because one you know, there's an interesting point there, TM, TM, TMIC, major semiconductor manufacturer in Taipei, in Taiwan, produced 30% of the semiconductors that are purchased by the Chinese. About the same America too. And so if there's war there, if that plant were ever get blown up, we'd be in a world of hurt. So Ukraine, my cut for the quick here. I think Putin has just put a lot of pressure on, since using Ukraine to put pressure on Europe. He's not gonna invade Ukraine, I don't think. But he's using all the military next to Ukraine, Ukraine um, and uh, with political pressure, cyber pressure, Position and politically, he's trying to weaken Europe a little bit. And I think he's, his thought is, well, America's not as strong today as maybe, maybe it was 15, 20 years ago. So he, Putin, maybe weaken Europe a little bit, maybe do some semi deals with France, maybe with Germany. But I think it's a psychological game, it's not a military game. Thank you. I actually have a quick follow up. Um, how does the installation of semiconductor manufacturing facilities? Sorry? How does the installation of semiconductor manufacturing facilities in the United States affect China's geopolitical strategy in relation to Taiwan? Well, as, as you know, we're um, we're semi decoupling China U.S. We're we're going to get balkanized in the world. China is sphere of influence a little bit. We in the West, ours, a little bit, a little bit. Europe, got India, and at least we're kind of hunkering down, protecting ourselves, being more independent. China's doing the same thing, much more independent. And I got to tell you, the Chinese really work hard. They'll do what it takes, and um, they're going to. Everybody says they're two, maybe even as many as ten years behind in manufacturing the most sophisticated semiconductors. But they're going to find a way. Um, we, as you know, are starting to manufacture more in the U.S. There are big new plants going in the U.S. Intel, other building plants. 
um, and we are doing that. You won't be ready for four or five years, but um, it's that's what's happening. I think it's unfortunate. Um, my view is all this back and forth with China. We're, we're, we're still going south. It's getting worse all the time. At some point, we're going to hit bottom. And I hope we hit bottom. It's a good bounce, not a bad bounce. <laughs> but we're hit bottom. When, we're, going to, we're going to hit bottom when both countries realize, especially the United States, that hey, we've got to work with these guys over there. China's a big country, it's not going away. We're not changing their behavior with all our sanctions. Xi Jinping doesn't care about President Biden not going over the Olympics because of human rights. But Xi Jinping doesn't care too who's about that. All our sanctions do not affect China's behavior. They, it doesn't, in fact, it hurts us as much more than it even hurts them. But it's an easy thing to do, to feel a good deal. <laughs> but it does not change their behavior. It does not. Thanks. Um, well, thank you so much for being here, Senator Bacchus, or Ambassador Bacchus, I guess. Max. <laughs> well, thank you, Max. Um, so my question is, in the 2008 election, you won. Sorry? Well, in the 2008 Senate election, you won by more than 50 points in Montana, one of the reddest states out there. Um, so my question is, how did you instill that much confidence in the people of Montana to re-elect a Democrat with more than 70% of the vote? Well, um, our times have changed. Um, Donald Trump won the state by about 10%. Um, and um, all the other majors are statewide Democratic candidates also lost by about 10%, roughly. So Donald Trump has a real strong influence in, in Montana today. Um, it's um, so your real question is, how's a Democrat win Montana? Is that your question? <laughs> how do you instill that much confidence in the Montana people, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat? Because for anyone, that's impressive. Well. It's, as I said, it's, it's harder. You gotta work a lot harder, uh, I think, because today, in our state, regrettably, there are more, more, more people, I think, vote down the line, Democrat or Republican. There's less ticket splitting today than there was, say, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And I think it's due to internet, social media, um, people don't think as much, shorter attention spans, they were tribalized. Um, it's just harder. It's much more difficult. Um, I, the answer is, is twofold. One is you just gotta just work your tail end off and just shake your hands, beat people, and have a message and listen. But second, you gotta raise a lot of money, <laughs> and so you can get your message out. Um, it's hard, but it's worth it. It's hard, but it's worth it. It's harder today. I'm, I'm look at it. I'll be honest. I don't know what, what year it was. We had all that money. No, what year was that? 2008. <laughs> <laughs> $24 million for yeah. your campaign. Yeah. Okay. I, I was chairman of the Senate Finance Committee, the most powerful committee in the Congress. I loved it. It has jurisdiction over but it, uh, almost all the revenue raised taxes. And jurisdiction where 80% of the money spent, Medicare, Social Security, and Medicaid and all that. And tr trade, health, I mean, it's, it's an amazing committee. But as chairman of that committee, a lot of CEOs would come in to see me. They want this, they want that. And, um, and, and so, this is the see me side of politics, the sense that there's too much money in politics. But, um, there was then, there's way too much today. Um, they, I, I could raise a lot of money. I raised a lot of money for the Montana Democratic Party, a lot. But we worked together as a team. I go to all the, can, the major candidates, even legislative candidates, it's okay, we're a team here, and before you issue your press release, environmentalists or labor unions or whatever, 
We have to prove it, and we'll give you a lot of money. We were together. We're a team. And um, it really worked. Um, but I'd like to think that we're a team with a good message and helping Montanans and helping people. Um, and anyway, gosh, that, that race, I won every single county in the state. Um, and uh, next election, that's all two. I I, I, I want, I'm, I'm really driven. <laughs> I want to win every single precinct in the state. <laughs> so we put together we call, what we call our Fabulous 50. They're the most difficult precincts in the state. Precincts are lost by the largest margin. So we went all around, we go, boy, we're going to focus on these precincts. Well, one of them is a Pinesdale. Pinesdale is a, is a polygamous community in our state. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I walked in there, and there's Father Jessup, he walked, he's very proud. He had something like 87 grandkids, something like that. <laughs> and um, we did a little better than Pinesdale, but we did not <laughs> He put a sign up. Yeah, he put a sign up. You know, Mr. Jessup put up a sign. <laughs> no, I don't know. I just, just have to work. And as a team. So, um, you know, a lot of us are aware in news and analysis that, um, you know, China is projected to be, you know, have a much larger economy, much more productive economy than the U.S. Um, soon. And, you know, a lot of the analysis and, and the sort of media is saying that this is going to be bad for the U.S., uh, and, but potentially good for the Chinese people. Uh, but I just wanted to, to ask, what does that really mean? Like, what does China emerging as a superpower like really mean for the world? I don't know if I understand all your questions, <laughs> but uh, if I don't give the right answer, if I'm not responsive, let me know. <laughs> um, China is a very proud country. Basically, Chinese think they're the, the, the civilization began in China thousands of years ago. Rich history. Different culture. Um, it's authoritarian. It's emperors. Emperors did well in China. If the people are doing well, the people aren't doing well, the emperors didn't do too well. And it's just in a cycle, it's wars. But they're very proud of their country. That's number one. Number two, a lot of Chinese today, are their parents remember, is, uh, is the deep uh, uh, convulsions in China, the Great Leap Forward, where tens of millions of people died. The Cultural Revolution, near the same thing. So a lot of them are survivalists. They're working hard because they know their parents, their grandparents died of starvation. And it's, that's, that's part of the reason they work so hard. They work much, they work harder than Americans do. Uh, and they're more confident of their future than I think Americans are, we Americans are of ours. Because they've done so well, they've come so far. They passed through what's called the century of humiliation, put upon by the Japanese and by other countries, foreign powers. Finally, that's all gone now. So now they're on their own. They opened up in the 70s. Um, and their economy today is three times larger than it was during the last Olympics in 2008. So they got the tiger by the tail. Um, they think their wins at their back. There's not much question about that in their mind. Now, they, do have, they have huge issues. Um, their population is aging. They don't have a lot of water. Um, and their neighbors don't like them very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that they're, I, I, there was no question trans be a major power. What do they want? Um, I, I think essentially Xi Jinping wants to be known in history as the person who really helped put China up on the same pedestal as the United States. I don't, if you look at Chinese history, they are not a military aggressor. Um, sure, some Chinese troops went to Korea, but that's good. We went to Korea. <laughs> and they're not a military aggressor. They, but they're gonna focus on their economy and build their economy up as strongly as it can. And that's why they're, have this Belt and Road Initiative around the world, 
in Africa, South America. I just read yesterday that they're spending a lot of money in Iraq for a lot of reasons. So they're, they're going to be strong. And um, we just have to recognize that and develop policies to show that we to tell, to show to them that they've got to respect us. They cannot take advantage of us. Um, and how do we do that? We do that by being very strong first at home. Because I believe the stronger we are at home economically and culturally and the, the teams, the country, the more we project power worldwide. The weaker we are at home, January 6th and all these things, the more other countries, including China, will start to push us around a little bit. And, uh, and so it's, it's really up to us. Well, one little story here that is, that is important. Maybe you gotta stop, we'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> but when President Xi um, came over to America with Obama, the summer was in 2015, we were really worried, we Americans, about China building all these islands in the South China Sea. They, what they do, Chinese, they dig up a lot of sand, dump the ocean, dump it on a reef, submerged reef, make an island out of it. There are a bunch of them in the South China Sea. We were kind of, we couldn't do much about it. That's just what they did. Even though the, human, uh, the court in Hague and the Netherlands ruled that's illegal, they didn't care. <laughs> Mike takes right, they just did it anyway. Anyway, we were very worried, we Americans, that the Chinese might militarize um, one, another island very nearby called Scarborough Shoal, just off the Philippines. And because um, um, if they did that, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the Philippine government. I'm just really, really worried about that. So I, I happened to be, uh, Mel and I were in D.C. for that summit. And the day before the President Obama met with President Xi, I was at lunch with our, our Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter. I wasn't the only one there, there were eight, nine, ten people around the table. We're all talking about China. <laughs> you know, there's lots of palaver, nothing really happened. And so I walked, after the lunch, I walked up to Ash Carter, I knew him. I said, Ash, now don't take this the wrong way. But this is virtual war. Um, if they build military installation on Scarborough Shoal, that's, that's virtual war. He says, here's what I think President Obama should do, said Ash Carter. Obama should get she in as small a room as possible and totally private, as few people as possible, and let President Xi straight in the eye and say, uh-uh, you're not going there. If you militarize Scarborough Show, Obama should say, you'll pay immense, irreparable repercussions. The face that. And I'm not going to tell you what we'll do, but you'll rue the day you went to Scarborough Show. Ash goes, that's a great idea. Let's go do that. Now, I think, I don't know. I think the White House has kind of had that in mind anyway. The next day, that's exactly what happened. President Obama uh, met with Xi Jinping. Who else is in the room? Susan Rice, National Security Advisor. A uh, fellow named Yang Jiechi, who is the major foreign guy for uh, China. Two interpreters. And that's what Obama did. And guess what? China backed off. They did not go to Russia. Now, maybe they're going to back off anyway. But my, my man, I mentioned all this because I, this is the approach we have to take. You have to get the respect. And the way you get respect is just privately, not publicly. Privately, just say, oh, this is where you're drawing the line here. And, um, and, and they'll get it. It's the old thing about bullies. You give a bully an inch, it takes a mile. But if you stand up to a bully, they back down. And China has a sense of being a bully. They'll do it. They'll, I mean, I was over there serving over there. It dawned on me after a short while. They're just going to keep on coming. They're just going to keep on coming until they're stopped. Stopped either externally or internally. Now, we can't do much about stopping them internally, but we can sure as heck can do something about stopping them externally. And um, well, the things are more sophisticated than that, but that's just, it's pretty simple, actually. Just respect and stand it up for what's right. Like they get it. Because he, Xi Jinping, cares really, I mean, he, he wants to the statue, be a major country, but he cares about his people too. Because leaders are the same the world over. 
if they take care of the people, then they can keep their job. <laughs> if they don't take care of the people, they're not going to keep their job. So that's his primary concern. Ambassador Bacchus, would you allow two to three more questions? I'm fine. It's up to you guys. <laughs> So before this, besides this aforementioned group of Texans, um, how do you feel as a Montanan about people coming here in hopes of making Montana their own? <laughs> I have mixed feelings. <laughs> Very mixed. I don't know. We live out in <clears throat> Spring Hill, up near the bridges, and almost every drive, some. God bless the new house is going up. <laughs> and it's just, I don't like it, to be honest. Um, but you know, there are amenities here, the interesting people here. Um, it's, it's a mixed blessing, it's a double edged sword. Over Christmas, I was reading um, a book by Michael Malone called A Contemporary Profile of Montana, and it was published in the late 90s. Um, and in there, he made some comments along the lines of Montana being at the whims of basically outside powers um, for economic reasons as well as political reasons. Um, with your experiences, do you share that opinion? Um, if so, why? And if not, why? Well, back then I think it was pretty true. And there's another history professor over, he was taught history, Mike Malone. Good guy. He wrote a good book about Butte. <laughs> Truly Butte. But another history professor over in Missoula, um, um, forget his name. Anyway, he made the same point. As, um, and I think back then it was very true. And that, frankly, that was, led to the basis of our, our new constitution. A lot of Montana really that ticked off for kind of the art then constitution, a prior constitution that was written with that favored out of state interests, with, with the taxation provisions in that constitution, for example. And um, so I guess it was pretty true then. Um, but you know, our code doesn't have quite the same. You know, Denny Washington owns mine up in Butte, but Denny's in Montana. Um, so it's, I don't think it's as bad now as it was then. Ross Tool, that's a guy. He's a professor. Ross Tool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But it's, it's like most things. You really can't control your own destiny if you work at it. But you got to work at it. You talked about the importance of speaking to people as people. What steps can we take as a nation to move toward politics that recognizes people as people? I don't know. <laughs> it's, you know, members, I'm, 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 my, what I know more about is the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. They, senators today, a lot of them, they're good people, they care, but they're under such pressures not to do what you suggest. The pressures are uh, just to cater to their, and raise money from their group. Because that's and then spend it. That's how they get reelected. I have to tell you, most they're good people, but most want to get reelected. And how do you get reelected? You do what you think the people back home want. But negative information has more potency and currency and travels faster than good news. And so people stir things up with bad news, get people all riled up. And um, I've said several times tonight. I think that's probably because of social media. Short attention spans we Americans have, shorter back now than back then. Internet, um, TV, we don't think, we don't read. Um, I asked a friend of mine, what I might say tonight, is a guy from Missoula, is well, he's a professor, law professor. This is not on point, but don't say what he said. I think it's something to it. Tell the students, to get off their, their, their games, their internet game. <laughs> Forget the games. Get out. Travel. I tell when high school kids come back to Washington, D.C., 
I say over and over and over again, I don't care what your parents say, I don't care what your teachers say, you get out, you travel. Go overseas. You don't have to go here like I did. Go for a few months. Go alone. Take a friend. Just get out of Dodge. <laughs> Just travel and, and get out of your comfort zone. Get out of your comfort zone. Take risks. One thing I've learned, I wish I'd taken more risks, frankly. I think in life you tend not to regret what you did, but you regret what you didn't do. You regret the risks that you didn't take. Go out and read um, Norm Esperanza's quote there on the wall. Get out of your God busted comfort zone. <laughs> Work, you know, be yourself, take risks. Good God, you're all so young. <laughs> you take, well, you're, you're gonna take, if you take risks, you're gonna take smart risks. You're not gonna, they may be dumb risks too. <laughs> But, you, but you'll learn from your wrists, and the next time you do something, you're like, oh gosh, I'm not gonna do that again. <laughs> but you, you'll learn so much, and it's so much more fun. It's so interesting. <laughs> Just get out of your God bless it. <laughs> you told us a really cool story about being an organ player at Boy State. Could you tell us a bit about your experience at Boys Nation and kind of how that influenced your um, career in public service? The only memory I have of Boys Nation is <laughs> out there we were at the University of Maryland campus. There was no air conditioning. I was lying on a cot in bed all night long with sweat dripping off. <laughs> That's all I remember about Boys Nation. <laughs> No, I, I remember a little more of it. That's my, that's my most vivid memory. Oh, yeah. I have a question. <laughs> All right, you've talked a lot about the increase in political um, divisiveness and how like partisanship has changed. Do you think an overturn of the Citizens United decision would have any... I'm sorry, part? do I think? Oh, would the, the, an overturn of the Citizens United decision by the Supreme Court would, in like campaign financing and all that, oh, oh. would different campaign finance law change the division in politics today? Well, that's a good question. Um, the trouble is we have something called the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court has interpreted the First Amendment as, as free speech is able to spend as much money as you want. As you want. That's, that's how it's currently interpreted. Now, of course, some other court could say, uh, uh that's not quite what the First Amendment says. And that, that, would, that would help. The slight problem we have in our country is um, that um, and today, what's today, third? There are about 100 people know that, um, well, let's take it before. 100 people know that there's going to be a presidential, presidential election in the first Tuesday of November 2024. They're already planning on it. Arranging your organization, starting to raise money, get things happen. And because money is so, so important uh, today. Contrast that with a parliamentary form of government. In Europe, France, Britain, all that. Nobody knows when election is going to be held. It's held when the prime minister decides it's going to be held. And he's got a lot of leeway, he or she does, when it's going to be held. And when, it's, when, the, when the election is called, there's only, I think it's about 30 days of election. That's all there is. And there's a lot less money um, in parliamentary elections compared to the United States. But the big problem is the First Amendment, how it's currently interpreted. Yeah, that, it, it helped with that one. Clearly, if that case were interpreted more narrowly, the First Amendment were interpreted more narrowly, but um, I, I, I just, people are going to find a way to give support, financial support, if not direct uh, money, in-kind contributions, it's all kinds of things that's going to happen. I, and I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to end up on a downer on that point, but I just, look at, um, you can get through that. Don't forget this. 
in a lot of presidential races, somebody like Connolly from Texas, he spent a gajillion dollars trying to get elected for not. There are a lot of examples where people spent a lot of money and didn't get elected. Um, so it's not, all, it's not only money. So if you, you gotta do both. It's like, you gotta be a really good candidate, gotta work your butt off, and, and shake hands, meet people, go around, leave no stone unturned, and raise some money. When I first ran for office, I remember thinking, I ran for legislature, <clears throat> gee, sometimes there's nagging little thought back in your head, maybe you should take care of that. Yeah, just mom, no, 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 you take care of it. You don't let any stone go unturned, anything. And it's cumulative. It starts to, start to build. So in the interest of time, I wanted to ask one final question. So you are at an institute of higher education, which is something that's becoming harder and harder for younger generations to access because of finance and a variety of other factors. What is your outlook on the future of higher education in the United States, and what do you believe needs to be done, whether it's older or younger generations, to make sure that more and more people can access a higher education? Well, first of all, you've got a great president here. And, and, and Wadi Rosado, she is aces. So you, you're lucky that she is thinking about that all of the time. Now, I might suggest, though, that, that higher education today, you've got to learn all the stuff. You know, STEM, I think STEM programs are critical. Um, so are the non-STEM programs, English, philosophy, etc. But I also think service is really important. And so I would look to partner with companies here in Montana. So you're working part-time with a company, part-time, you're going to school, and if you get the hands-on experience, I, I would look to more of that, frankly. Because the practical experience is, is so, so critical. Ambassador Rogers, Regent Rogers, it was just a phenomenal evening. I don't think we'll ever forget it. I'm so proud of the students here, and I've been looking at their expressions. The, you know, seeds are being planted here that are just extraordinary. And half the student senate came here. <laughs> <laughs> they did the they did senate business for about 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm so proud of them. Um, so before we conclude, I have two students who would like to say thank you and have some yeah. gifts. And I would love it if we can, for the students who would like to, to take, I'd like to take a group photo of you guys just by the screen, with Richard Rogers and Ambassador Rockers, just right afterwards. But Caroline and Tommy, would you please present your gifts? Well, 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 I don't have a chance to say anything. My advice will always just, look, you're young, you're smart. Go for it. <laughs> you just follow your instincts and go even farther. Don't look back. You'll make mistakes. I hope you do make mistakes because you'll learn from them. But just go, go, go. And um, you're gonna inspire a lot of people when you're doing it. <laughs>